Uh, welcome back. Still with Sheffield United left back of old, the Dave Bassett era, Tom Cowan, or Tommy Cowan, as uh, he was often referred to, uh, with uh, referee, who's referred to in many different ways on, on Sunday morning <laughs> by players who've been introduced a note of humour into it, mm. Paul Cooper, all of which we, we, we can't mention, but there is a, a big serious side to the way that referees are treated and match officials and getting them in. So we'll have more tales from the, the touchline there. Uh, in the first half, um, Tom was talking about the casualty rate of managers in the professional game, 43 changes among the 92 clubs, getting on for 50%. It happens in the non-league game as well, just to sort of fill in a, a few uh, other parts from the roundup that James Gregg normally delivers here. Sheffield FC this week. I don't know if uh, either of you follow the progress of our non-league clubs, two famous ones here, Sheffield FC and Hallam. Sheffield uh, have their manager, well, it was, it was said that he'd stepped down. This was a rather nice way of, of putting it. This was uh, Andy Kawamia, a uh, good guy who's been, been in this mm -hmm. studio, poor run of results. Uh, he's become youth development manager, which is good, so he's, he's not left the club. But as so often happens, as so often happens, they go and win the next match. And that's, you know, and it often covers things over for a while. But uh, well done to Christopher Dolby, uh, the caretaker boss uh, installed for possibly just the one match, a great victory at Belper Town. And there's been a lot of speculation around the city this week as to who is going to succeed Andy uh, Kiwomia. Uh, one name I heard was Peter Duffield. Did, did you play with Peter Duffield? Uh, yeah, we were at uh, Retford together. He was manager at Retford and I went and played for Retford for two seasons. We actually got promoted two seasons in a row out the same league which was a nice. strange one. <laughs> they wouldn't let us go up because the right. turnstiles weren't uh, up to scratch for the, going up into the next league. So then we had to get promoted again in the same league the year after. That's and one for the record. Yeah, books, it's a it? strange one, that. Yeah, so we got the same So Retford place. United, mm -hmm. and he was manager there. Yes. Uh, he's, he's actually uh, not in the game at the minute. Uh, Midweek, uh, you know, I, I honestly thought that he would b get the job or be offered it. There's a considerable doubt as to whether he'll accept it for whatever whatever reason, so I don't think it's going to be that, but uh, oh, yeah. he was a striker at the, at the lane in your time. Yeah, yeah, I love Duff to be fair. Scored loads of goals. Yeah, he was, he was a good player, uh, he yeah. was a good lad as well. Uh, we used to travel in and out together as well at Sheffield United. Uh, we used to live out sort of Baiton Way and used to try, drive in together. Right, well it remains to be seen about him. I, I think the two candidates would be uh, Ryan Hindley, now there's an interesting one, he's uh, manager of Hallam FC, having a great season, pushing for the playoffs, get along to Sandygate this weekend on, on Saturday. You'll see a good game, I know you all see a good game at that level. They are pushing for the playoffs, they need your support and they're well worth it as well. And another contender who I think is the dark horse, you know, I, if I had a bet, I, I'd, I'd say a dark horse was James Colliver of uh, Clipton, uh, Clipston rather, in, in Nottinghamshire, Clipston FC. Uh, would be a dark horse, I think, for the Sheffield FC job. We'll have to uh, watch this space. Uh, good luck, Sheffield, over the weekend. Sheffield Steelers, just a quick mention of ice hockey, which we do here. Hoping to have a, a big Steelers guest in the studio uh, shortly. We had the captain, Jonathan Phillips, not so long ago. Terrific win uh, the other night against Manchester, at Manchester Storm, 4-3, uh, maintaining their push for the title. So good luck, Steelers, again uh, this weekend. Sheffield Eagles. Uh, building up, uh, having a, a very good start uh, to their season, a couple of wins. They're back in Sheffield now, the Sheffield Hallam, uh, Sheffield Hallam University uh, Sports Park. Get along to see them if you can. And we'll have the full gamut uh, of news back with James next week when he looks at golf. Uh, I think uh, one or two of our golfers are doing well. We're big on golf in, in this area, rugby union and anything you care to mention. But meantime, let's go back as we started the programme uh, to the Blades again. Uh, is it the players or is it the manager or is it, that, is it, is it too simplistic to uh, say either? Yeah, I don't really know, to be honest with you. I think the managers are bringing in the wrong players, which then you look at both then, don't you? Um, there just seems to be a lack of pride in the jersey at the moment. Um, a lot of a lot of people have said it. Um, I'll say it on air again. But it just it just seems as if they go one nil down. There's not that massive fight and that urge to get back in the game anymore that old Sheffield United teams used to have. Where you know uh, why are we one nil down? We shouldn't be we shouldn't be getting beat. Um, but they just don't seem to have that. It's like a, a lacklustre performances that they're putting in at the moment. Doesn't seem to be a great sense of identity about the way. 
they play and an affinity with the crowd and the crowd are starting to say now we just want up and atom football yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I think attack, that's attack, what, attack 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 that's what they've been looking for for years yeah uh, and it's been sadly lacking uh, in previous few seasons the support's been there though remarkable oh, the support, crowds the support 19, is brilliant. regularly yeah I mean I think they've not dropped much since Premier League days I think 25 26,000 when we were there playing yeah. in the Premier League and it's down to just 20,000 now and it's like 5,000 and mm. it's basically two leagues you'd expect a lot bigger drop than that mm. Do you know I think when a team's struggling people always try and find one person to blame be it the chairman or in Sheffield United's case co-chairman uh, other board members the manager and I never think it's one person it's a collective always a collective no it's never one person and that's the problem uh, that this day and age that they're having, I think we spoke about it at the first half of the programme, the amount of managers that are getting sacked this year, I think it's 43 you said, I, I, I checked I thought it was 42 but you mm. said it's 43. Uh, yeah. Not all sacked obviously, no. um, Most. but 92 football league clubs who have changed their manager this season alone, 42, yeah. Yeah. That, that's horrendous, that's terrible, that just shows you that, I mean, the majority of them will be sacked, um, a few have left, I think a few have left, Martin Ling left for illness, health mm. reasons, um, a few have obviously stepped up for better jobs, stuff like that, but uh, a majority of them are being sacked. And can, can not Sheffield United take some moral high ground finally by not doing what everybody expects them to do? I would like to think so. I would, I would hope that they do stick with Nigel Atkins because he's trying to put a structure in place, and all managers do, mm. um, but you just hope that if he's given time, it'll, it'll come to fruition in the end. Mm. Time. Stability and time. Want stability. Well, everyone wants stability in football clubs, but time, I mean, time is what managers we're, won't we're, ever have. We're not whitewashing him. He's had a poor season. He's obviously made mistakes. Some of his signings last summer have not worked. Uh, but he's not even had a full season yet, and he's only had one transfer window, during which, although he brought in players of his choice, he lost arguably the best player in that window, Jamie Murphy, and brought nobody in during January because the squad needs... Yeah, but is that down to him or is that down to the board not giving him any leeway, you know, saying we, we I'd need the suspect, money? I'd suspect it was down to the board. That's a guess. Yeah, and, and managers can't come out and say that because no. they'll just end up getting, getting chastised from above. Uh, they're in a no-win situation sometimes. Uh, I don't like hammering managers. Um, but to be honest with you, we have went far, through far too many in the past three or four years Mm. Um, and it doesn't seem to be working. Mm. Why don't yeah. we just stick with one manager, see what he can do for the next two or three years, as long as you don't get relegated. Yeah. <laughs> That's the main thing. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you say that. I would have uh, just uh, dismissed that a few weeks ago. I don't think that's going to happen. Oh, it's, no, it's never going to happen. It's that no way. Position. It's, um, it's to you just even saying that just kind of shows the kind of atmosphere there is a, around Bramall Lane. They need the crowd on side, but the players have to get them on side. Players have to give them something to bite on uh, against Port Vale. Bite on in the right in the right way. Yeah, it's, it all comes down to confidence with players. Yeah. Uh, I've been there and seen it and done it. And uh, it, if you're not playing well and the crowd starts getting on your back, that is the worst thing that can ever happen to you as a player. Because mm. uh, as soon as you you start losing and touching, I mean, how many? The amount of times that I've been booed off, not me personally, but being booed off the pitch because I'll get beaten, and it's a, it's a terrible, terrible feeling. It may, I mean, it, you might think that players go home to their luxury 15-bedroom uh, mansions and uh, drive home in their Ferraris and all that. It's, they might, they might do, oh. but um, they actually hurt inside when they go home when they get when they, they get a defeat, and it, it lasts a long time. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, halfway through the week, I'm, I used to still think what I could be doing or what I could have done differently, you know, uh, the mistakes that I made, you know, what could I have done to, to rectify them. And then people um, start not wanting the ball. That's the danger, isn't it? Uh, yeah, um, I was never brilliant on the ball anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever gave you the ball, did no, they? Not no. playing long ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, as we said, uh, always a collective thing. And I, I always think every time a club employs a manager and sacks him within a short time period, the real failure the real failure is with the club because it's appointed a guy and sacked him. That's where the real failure lies, which is, I think, something Sheffield United should focus on now and say, OK, we've set this course. We'll take a bit of pain for long-term gain. That's only one view. Yeah, yeah, you and agree I, I agree with that view wholeheartedly. Yeah. The only problem is that you've got chairmen who are on a power trip and they want their club to do well. 
and they think the only way that they can do that is by sacking manager. Whereas, on the other hand, it's probably better not to sack the manager. Mm. But of course, you've got to resist crowd pressure, and that's starting to build. But I don't think the majority want Nigel Atkins out. That's my, my gauge of it. But it's important mm. for people not to listen to the loud voices all the time, because they're nearly always the ones that say, sack the manager. They're not necessarily a majority. No, that's true, and his, his record speaks for itself. He's done ever so well at Southampton. Yeah. Um, uh, Scunthorpe did very, very well, and you just hope to hope that he gets it right at Sheffield United, and yeah. we can push on maybe next season for promotion. I mean, the season isn't even over. It's only, I mean, we're only just over, just over halfway. halfway. There yeah. might even be a chance of getting into the playoffs. Do you know Indeed. what I mean? I know we're, we're quite it's a wee bit away, but uh, there's still a ch right. yeah, there's still a chance there. Dead right. And I think many Sheffield Wednesday fans all want Nigel Atkins to stay there because. <laughs> they think he's doing a great job. <laughs> well, Agent Atkins. Agent Atkins, yeah. 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 He very nearly came to Sheffield Wednesday some years ago. Yeah, you know, when Brian Laws was offered the, uh, the Wednesday job and took it, there was an arrangement that Atkins would follow him from Scunthorpe. But Atkins did so well as caretaker and was then offered that job that that, that actually never happened. So Atkins mm. could have been at uh, Sheffield Wednesday. I detect a distinct lack of sympathy from you as a, a referee yeah. for <laughs> the anguish that players... Uh, experience when uh, the crowd get on their back. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's. Uh, it, I mean, t Tom raised a good issue there about uh, being booed off a field and uh, you know feeling dejected and you know going home afterwards and thinking you know what could I have done differently and better. It's exactly the same for a referee. You know, if a referee comes off off a game and, and it's not gone particularly well for him, you know, the referee you know doesn't go home and forget about that. Yeah. Again, you know, it, a referee will mull it over in the head. So, what could I have done differently? You know, the, the out, to change that outcome, or could I have handled the player uh, in a different way, or could I have been in a better position to see that, uh, you know, a tattle for for the penalty that I gave, you know, or that offside decision. So, you know, when people raise um, uh, errors that they think that the referees made, you know, it does weigh on referees' minds. I'm you sure know, uh, long after. You know, they, they blow that final whistle on a Sunday afternoon. We'll come on next to the question of touchline behaviour. Go on, Tom. Bet you've been, no one's ever been booed by both sets of fans, which happened to <laughs> me once. I, I was at Cambridge United and I went on loan to Peterborough, which is their sort of like <laughs> arch rivals. Mm. Uh, and we played the next game, we played uh, Cambridge and a home game at Peterborough. And every time I touched the ball, I got booed by every set of fans. So it was, yeah. you know, it was, it was terrible. <laughs> no, it's happened to me. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was the worst thing ever. It's quite was funny. It? Yeah, some players would enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, there are yeah. some that who really get off on that kind of thing. Yeah, we ended up winning. Yeah, Did well, you? Peterborough beat Cambridge, but Cambridge you... was still my club that I was sent <laughs> to. That I was on loan at Peterborough. It was you... a strange situation. <laughs> you couldn't lose. We'll come on to the touchlines with Paul Cooper on the behaviour of managers and, and coaches both at, in the amateur game and the professional game, after we had a very brief interlude for squash. Uh, earlier, just before coming on air, I spoke to uh, Sheffield's three times world squash champion and now eight times British national champion. I know it's incredible. I can hardly believe it. I don't think he can. Nick Matthew uh, about uh, his uh, new uh, squash academy, um, getting youngsters in, coaching them in the rudiments of squash, encouraging them to get involved in the sport at the Hallamshire uh, Tennis and Squash Club here in Sheffield. But he's had uh, a lot of media attention today. What you're about to hear is one of many, many interviews that he's done. So, so I asked him if he'd had time to do any coaching. <laughs> yeah, um, the priority is the kids today, that's for sure. You know, uh, my career can go on hold. Uh, you know, it's more important the kids launching the academy at Hallamshire. Um, it's just fantastic. It's my way of giving something back to a sport that's given me so much. How many kids have you had down there today? It's very important, isn't it, to get them playing squash? It is. It's important to get them um, kids playing any sport. You know, the fact that squash is my passion, where my expertise lies, you know, that's sort of the, the involvement and the, the sort of the knock-on effect, the benefit that I can sort of pass on um, to future generations. You know, Squash has been voted the world's healthiest sport for the last two years. So I think it's the, it's the perfect sport for kids to be um, playing, especially a lot of publicity these days is about sort of how active our, our kids are. They're playing too many computer games, mm -hmm. um, are they getting the right diet, etc. You know, squash is a great sport to sort of counter all that. 
Yeah, I must congratulate you as well. You've, you've come straight off winning the British National uh, Championships for the eighth time. Eighth time, <laughs> can you believe that? Yeah, it sort of shows my age a little bit, so I thought I'd best to set something up, you know, uh, for the next generation because, uh, you know, I think uh, winning eight titles, it means you've been around for at least uh, probably double that amount of years on the tour because these things don't happen overnight and, uh, you know, absolute honour to have that, get that record eight title over the weekend. Uh, yeah. British National Championships is, is, a, is a world uh, standard event. Uh, world number one we have in England in the women's in Laura Massaro and James Woolstrop, my final opponent in the men's. At one stage, we were ranked one, number one and number two in the world ourselves. So it's a tough title to win. Mm, I'm guessing you must be 28 or 29 now then. <laughs> I wish, Alan. I wish. <laughs> but you're still going strong. Squash uh, is a great sport, but it's not always the sport that youngsters automatically go into, isn't it? is not it? So you're hoping to use your profile here in Sheffield to change that a little bit. Yes, exactly. You know, I'm, I've been so fortunate that we've had the support of Hallam Squash Club, which is the squash club I first started out playing at when I was eight years old, and support from One Health as well, healthcare partners who are you know, enable us to take this out to schools, to universities, to people who have never played the game of squash before, and hopefully will you know encompass all levels. You know, the, the squad that currently is existing um, is an elite squad. Uh, while I'm still playing on the tour, but there's plans afoot to to take the sport of squash around the sort of general public and take it around the country as well when I get a bit more time on my hands to upon retirement. Yeah, I'm talking of time, we'll, 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 we'll have to love you and leave you. I know you've got plenty uh, going on there, but just we before you... We can talk about retirement another day, Alan. I get asked that question a lot at the moment. So we'll, we'll put that one on hold for another day. Yeah, well, Sheffield Wednesday, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, I did see your column in the Star, um, and you take a keen interest in other sports. Just briefly, you, you, you're clearly quite delighted at what's going on at Hillsborough at the minute. We, we all are, yeah. It's, I think it's because we've not had much... Uh, you know, it's been a long time since the last time we had something to shout about. So it feels like when they're top of the league in a weird sort of way, doesn't it? Even though, you know, we're, we're fit. And, um, people are thinking about automatic, but I would settle for the playoffs, to be honest. Um, not that I'm not dreaming, but I think you know, 12 games to go, they're bound to have a little bit of a sticky patch at some point. And uh, getting in the playoffs and getting the hills of crowd behind us in, in a two-leg semi-final, there's no reason why we can't uh, get to the final. That'd be an amazing day for the club. It would indeed. Well, maybe we can touch on that because uh, I think uh, in a few weeks' time you, you, you're going to grace us with your presence uh, here in, in the studio. I look right? forward to that. Hopefully, you no. Know, last time we came, we had to. Uh, on our snowshoes, didn't we, to get into the studio? So, looking forward to a nice night this time. We did a foot of snow. We had to come down by by, by train, and it, it was a precarious journey. But uh, Nick, thanks very much indeed. I think that's March the 31st. We do look forward to that. Thanks for joining us, thanks, and very best of luck with the academy. Thank you very much. Uh, a chat with Nick uh, Matthew just before we came on air tonight. Really looking forward to seeing Nick here in this studio in a few weeks' time, March the 31st. Meantime, uh, still with Tom Cowan uh, and with uh, Paul Cooper. Uh, Paul, you told us in the first half about just one incident when you've had abuse and threats mm -hmm. from players. I'm sure it's not the only one that you've encountered over the years. No, it's not the only one. Um, but, you know, I say as a referee for 12 years, sometimes doing four games a week, mm. which, which, you know, which was capable of, uh, you know, Things do, you know, things do happen. Things do escalate, but that's probably by most the most serious uh, incidents happened to me. Right. Um, again, you know, you get instances where you know players are overly aggressive. Um, you know, you just have to deal with each instance that that's put in front, you know, put in front of you to your best ability. Can, can I come on to touchline? And we get used now to managers and coaches at professional level being part of the show, part of the entertainment gesticulating, rounding on the fourth official, giving him a mouthful every every few minutes. It's pure theatre, pure pantomime. It can't do you any favours because I'm sure that gets aped uh, on a Sunday morning, that behaviour. Sunday morning is, is a little bit different because you've not got the, uh, in a lot of the grounds of parks, football, you don't have dugouts 
in yeah. Parks Football. You know, it's just a football pitch. You know, where and that, that, that's the only facilities you've got. And you've, you've got, got no you, fourth official. You've got no fourth official, no linesman. Nobody um, controlling these guys. You're having to control these guys. Yeah. And they're often coming right up at the touchline, all the way up the touchline, aren't they? Yeah, you'll get instances of, uh, of, uh, of people walking up and down the touchline following play. You'll get a lot of instances with actually uh, spectators and, and management team actually coming onto the field. You know, if a ball's going down into a, into a corner, they'll actually walk onto the pitch to... You know, to see where the ball's going into the into the, into the far corner, mm. so you know you have no to escape. be aware of that. No uh, escape. Yeah, no escape. So you have to you know usher them off and, the off the field. And should they be taking more responsibility for their players? Yeah, they, they should. Do? Yeah, they should. Um, you know, you know, I turn up on a Sunday morning, and and I'm expected to manage 22 mm. players on a on a football pitch who I've never met before. Yeah. You know, uh, and you know, there's managers and coaches who they should be sec they should be taking responsibility. For their players and, the, and their spectators' actions, mm. uh, you know. So, you know, and if they can't manage that situation, how do they expect somebody who's, you know, they may know me from from refereeing previous matches with them, but how do they expect an individual who's got no real relationship uh, personally with any of those players to be able to manage them, uh, you know, in a way other than under the the laws of the game? Mm. Do you think that what goes on in the pro game could set a better example lower down, Tom? I think it does. Um, a lot of it all comes down to money. The money that the, the managers are earning. Uh, they need to be shown to be doing something on the, yeah. on this, the touch line. Um, throwing your arms about might not be the, the main thing, but yeah. they're standing there and, and being visible to, to the fans because they're, they're earning so much money to be running a team. Um, I didn't, didn't used to happen in my day. No. The managers used to just sit in the dugout. And Indeed, you never saw them. Really, yeah, the only time they used to come out was on the odd occasion where they had something to tell you because they'd already given you the they're information. Not, they're not doing they... any good there at all. No, they're well, there for show, aren't they? Well, yeah. you, they'd already given you most of the information before you got into the pitch, and they've got yeah. half time to sort any problems out that yeah. if you weren't doing it in the first half, then you do this in the second half. We've not got long left. I know that during the break, uh, Paul here made a point to me that the individual leagues and the authorities of these leagues do take these issues very, very seriously. Yeah. They do try and deal with it. Certainly the FA do, the regional uh, FAs do. Uh, you made the point that there could be more members for the Sheffield Referees Association because it would help them. But do the FA actually do enough uh, in terms of education and support of young referees? Um, or referees well, it's, when you say the FA, it's actually drill, drilled down to the local county FA. Yeah. So local football, you know, that will come out from, from, from the team down there. So they're a very, very hard-working bunch down at the county FA and they, they do everything for the good of football. But there's not enough of them. No. You know, there isn't actually enough, and we've got a referees department that's got, we've got 1,100 referees and we've got two guys. Who are, with all the admin, yeah, with trying all the, to sort all this yeah. out, inundated, yeah. Yeah. cases, disciplinary cases well, all the time. The so you deal with more, the more staff there, the more incidents could be dealt with. Yeah, and uh, more there is a disciplinary department, uh, but, you know, but they're, you know, sort of short-staffed. Yeah. We've got two, you know, we've got two referee development officers who have to sort of look after 1,100 referees. Mm. You know, so and that's promotion candidates, and that's uh, you know people who are having you know a bad time, you know, to support to support them as well. You've identified something there that's a key area for the the, the FA nationally to look at within mm. its uh, local associations, its county associations. More support, more men on the ground, women on the ground. Tom Cowan, brilliant to see you again. Thanks ever so much for coming in. And Paul Cooper, hope the rest of the season treats you Thank a lot you, better. Yeah. Sheffield Wednesday at Preston uh, this weekend. Sheffield United at home to Port Vale. Here's to a City double. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Uh, welcome back, still with Sheffield United left back of old, the Dave Bassett era, Tom Cowan, or Tommy Cowan as uh, he was often referred to, uh, with uh, referee, it was referred to in many different ways on, on Sunday morning <laughs> by players who've been introduced a note of humour into it, mm. Paul Cooper, all of which we, we, we can't mention, but there is a, a big serious side to the way that referees are treated and match officials and getting them in, so we'll have more tales from the, the touchline there. Uh, in the first half, um, Tom was talking about the 
casualty rate of managers in the professional game, 43 changes among the 92 clubs, getting on for 50%. It happens in the non-league game as well, just to sort of fill in a, a few uh, other parts from the roundup that James Gregg normally delivers here. Sheffield FC this week. I don't know if uh, either of you follow the progress of our non-league clubs. Two famous ones here, Sheffield FC and Hallam. Sheffield uh, have their manager. Well, it was, it was said that he'd stepped down. This was a rather nice way of, of putting it. This was uh, Andy Kawamia, a uh, good guy who's been, been in this mm -hmm. studio, poor run of results. Uh, he's become youth development manager, which is good. So he's, he's not left the club. But as so often happens, as so often happens, they go and win the next match. And that's, you know, and it often covers things over for a while. But uh, well done to Christopher Dolby, uh, the caretaker boss uh, installed for possibly just the one match, a great victory at Belper Town. And there's been a lot of speculation around the city this week as to who is going to succeed Andy uh, Kiwomia. Uh, one name I heard was Peter Duffield. D did you play with Peter Duffield? Uh, right? Yeah, we like. were at uh, Retford together. He was manager at Retford and I went and played for Retford for two seasons. We actually got promoted two seasons in a row out the same league, which was a strange one. <laughs> they wouldn't let us go up because the right. turnstiles weren't uh, up to scratch for the going up into the next league. So then we had to get promoted again in the same league the year after. That's um, one for the record. Yeah, it's a strange one, that. Yeah, so we got the same That's at Retford place. United, mm -hmm. and he was manager there. Yes. Uh, he's, he's actually uh, not in the game at the minute. Uh, Midweek, uh, you know, I, I honestly thought that he would b get the job or be offered it. There's a considerable doubt as to whether he'll accept it for whatever, whatever reason. So I don't mm. think it's going to be that. But uh, oh, yeah. he was a striker at the, at the lane in your time. Yeah, yeah. I loved Duff to be fair. Scored loads of goals. Yeah, he was, he was a good player. Uh, he yeah. was a good lad as well. Uh, we used to travel in and out together as well at Sheffield United. Uh, we used to live out sort of baiting way and used to try drive in together. Right. Well, it remains to be seen about him. I, I think the two candidates would be uh, Ryan Hindley. Now, there's an interesting one. He's uh, manager of Hallam FC, having a great season, pushing for the playoffs. Get along to Sandygate this weekend on, on Saturday. You'll see a good game. I know you all see a good game at that level. They are pushing for the playoffs. They need your support, and they're well worth it as well. And another contender who I think is the dark horse, you know. Uh, if I had a bet, I, I'd, I'd say a dark horse was James Colliver, of uh, Clipton, uh, Clipston rather, in, in Nottinghamshire, Clipston FC, uh, would be a dark horse, I think, for the Sheffield FC job. We'll have to uh, watch this space. Uh, good luck, Sheffield, over the weekend. Sheffield Steel, he's obviously made mistakes. Some of his signings last summer have not worked. Uh, but he's not even had a full season yet, and he's only had one transfer window, during which, although he brought in players of his choice, he lost arguably the best player in that window, Jamie Murphy, and brought nobody in during January because the squad needs. Yeah, is that down to him or is that down to the board not giving him any leeway? You know, saying we, we I'd need the money. I suspect it was down to the board. That's a guess. Yeah, and, and managers can't come out and say that because no. they'll just end up getting getting chastised from above. Uh, they're in a no-win situation sometimes. Uh, I don't like hammering managers, um, but to be honest, we we have went far, through far too many in the past three or four years. Mm. Um, and it doesn't seem to be working. Mm. Why don't yeah. we just stick with the one manager, see what he can do for the next two or three years, as long as you don't get relegated. <laughs> yeah. That's the main thing. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you say that. I would have uh, just uh, dismissed that a few weeks ago. I don't think that's going to happen. Oh, it's, no, it's never going to happen. It's no way. But position. It's, um, it's to you just even saying that just kind of shows the kind of atmosphere there is around Bramall Lane. They need the crowd on side, but the players have to get them on side. Players have to give them something to bite on uh, against Port Vale. Bite on in the right in the right way. Yeah, it's, it all comes down to confidence with players. Yeah. Uh, I've been there and seen it and done it. And uh, it, if you're not playing well and the crowd starts getting on your back, that is the worst thing that can ever happen to you as a player. Because mm. uh, as soon as you you start losing and touching, I mean, how many? The amount of times that I've been booed off, not me personally, but being booed off the pitch because I'll get beaten, and it's a, it's a terrible, terrible feeling. It may, I mean, you might think that players go home to their luxury 15-bedroom, you know, and it's been sadly lacking uh, in previous few seasons. The support's been there, though. Remarkable oh, the support, crowds, the 19,000 regularly. Yeah, I mean, I think they've not dropped much since Premier League days. I think 25, 26,000 when we were there. 
playing yeah. in the Premier League and it's down to just 20,000 now and it's like 5,000 and mm. it's basically two leagues. You'd expect a lot bigger drop than that. Mm. You know, I think when a team's struggling, people always try and find one person to blame, be it the chairman or in Sheffield United's case, co-chairman, uh, other board members, the manager. And I never think it's one person, it's a collective, always a collective. No, it's never one person and that's the problem. Uh, that this day and age that they're having, I think we spoke about it at the first half of the programme, the amount of managers that are getting sacked this year, I think it's 43 you said, I, I, I checked, I thought it was 42, but you said mm. it's 43. Uh, yeah. Not all sacked obviously, no, um, most. but 92 football league clubs who have changed their manager this season alone, 42, yeah. Yeah. That, that's horrendous, that's terrible, that just shows you that, I mean, the majority of them will be sacked, um, a few have left, I think a few have left, Martin Ling left for Ill illness, health reasons, um, a few have obviously stepped up for better jobs, stuff like that, but a majority of them are being sacked. And can, can not Sheffield United take some moral high ground finally by not doing what everybody expects them to do? I would like to think so. I would, I would hope that they do stick with Nigel Atkins because he's trying to put a structure in place, and all managers do, mm. um, but you just hope that if he's given time, it'll, it'll come to fruition in the end. Mm. Time. Same, same. Want well, everyone wants stability in football clubs, but time, I mean, time is what managers we're, would we're, ever have. We're not whitewashing him, he's had a poor season. There's just a quick mention of ice hockey, which we do here. Hoping to have a, a big Steelers guest in the studio uh, shortly. We had the captain, Jonathan Phillips, not so long ago. Terrific win uh, the other night against Manchester at Manchester Storm, 4-3, uh, maintaining their push for the title. So good luck Steelers again uh, this weekend. Sheffield Eagles uh, building up, uh, having a, a very good start uh, to their season, a couple of wins. They're back in Sheffield now at the Sheffield Hallam, uh, Sheffield Hallam University uh, Sports Park. Get along to see them if you can and we'll have the full gamut uh, of news back with James next week when he looks at golf. Uh, I think uh, one or two of our golfers are doing well. We're big on golf in, in this area, rugby union and anything you care to mention. But meantime, let's go back as we started the programme uh, to the Blades again. Uh, is it the players or is it the manager or is it, that, is it, is it too simplistic to say uh, either? Yeah, I don't really know, to be honest with you. I think the managers are bringing in the wrong players, which then you look at both then, don't you? Um, there just seems to be a lack of pride in the jersey at the moment. Um, a lot of a lot of people have said it. Um, I'll say it on air again. But I just it just seems as if they go one 0 down. There's not that massive fight and that urge to get back in the game anymore that old Sheffield United teams used to have. Where you know uh, why are we one 0 down? We shouldn't be we shouldn't be getting beat. Um, but they just don't seem to have that. It's like a, a lacklustre performances that they're putting in at the moment. There doesn't seem to be a great sense of identity about the way they play and an affinity with the crowd and the crowd are starting to say now we just want up and at them football yeah uh, yeah i think attack 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 i think that's what they've been looking for for years yeah uh,